we were beaten by cities issues and later on for the last 20 years I've been working on issues related to sustainable mobility and parks and open spaces and one of my brothers he became mayor of Bogota and actually I remember he used to say here you know a developed city not the one where the poor have cars but it's actually the one where the rich use public transit and currently yeah, he's running for president of Colombia and this photo was taken last week when he went to register his name for the candidate and obviously he used sustainable mobility to go with a group of followers and his wife and the VP. But this is so also a symbol of things do or need to be different. Unfortunately, many of the issues from 76 are still relevant today. We have not done much in many areas. I mean, we got 2.5 billion, we got a billion cars today, we're going to go to 2.5 billion by 2050. So obviously, what is broken and what needs to be fixed, there are many things that are broken. When we look at any city from the air, the biggest from Medellin or Bogotá or Toronto or Mumbai or anywhere, the biggest public space are the streets. So how are we going to use it if it's the public space? We know that walking and cycling and transit takes up a lot fewer space than cars. So we got to change our minds. I love to talk to children because children don't have any baggage. And people say, oh, the children, because they are the future. No. We just heard that we got 3 billion people in living in cities. And in 30 years, we're going to have 6 billion. We cannot wait 20 or 30 years. We've got to work with children. It's because if we educate the children very, very well, then they go home. And then they educate their parents. And then we create change. Here, we were asking the children, how would you like your community to be when you have your parents' age? And you have children your own age? And look at some of the things the children were saying. They said, Edward said, I want few cars, and then you want many people walking, many people cycling. And you do an area for pedestrians, for cyclists, for buses, and for cars. He's only 13, but he knows that if we mix pedestrians and cyclists, the pedestrian is going to get injured. If we mix cyclists and cars, the cyclist is going to get injured. So each one is own space, and then we do public parks and low buildings with street level activity. So some of you might say, oh, here, it's not rocket science. No, the thing that we are talking about this week is not rocket science. I mean, the children know what needs to be done. I mean, if we brought the other three billion people in communities like this, it would be in very nice communities. I mean, sustainable transport and just cities, this is not a technical issue. This is not a financial issue. It's a political issue. That's why it's an issue where everybody has to get involved. I mean, are we going to do streets for cars or streets for people? We can do one or the other. Do we want a street to look like car storage or actually to help create communities? Are we going to do these gigantic parking that work like a bathroom that sucks the light out of the city or we street put street level activity? I mean, do we have 93 cars parked or do we have a pedestrian street? Obviously, all of this is not unanimous. All of this is not easy. Change doesn't happen by unanimous. It's not unanimous. Change is hard in Medellin or in Sao Paulo or everywhere. So how do we create cities for all? Currently, I'm executive director of an organization that is eight and eighty cities. So it's not only eight to eighty. It's not. It's from zero to a hundred. Eight and eighty is like an indicator species. If things are great for an A and great for an 80, then it's going to be great for the A and 80. And I had the pleasure to work in more than 150 different cities in the last eight years. And one of the things that I learned is that in cities for people, the priority of the children, the older adults, and the poor. Who are our most vulnerable to citizens? Who are, from the point of view of mobility and from any point of view, the most vulnerable are the children, the older adults, and the poor. So when you go to any city, you want to evaluate how good that city? See, how do they treat their children, the older adults, and the poor? And you realize how good that is that city for me. I mean, what is this 8 and 80 cities? It's not about walking or cycling or transit or parks. Those are the means. The end is, how can we contribute to create vibrant cities and healthy communities where the people are going to be happy, enjoying their parks and their public spaces? And always people say, okay, oh, is this intersection safe? Can I send my children walking to school? Can my, grand my grandparents walk to get eggs or milk? Can they walk to get take public transit? I said, look, you don't have to be a transportation engineer. Three simple steps. 
think of a child that you love around eight years old. When you have that child in mind, think of an 80 year old that also you love, your parents, your grandparents. And when you have the child and the older adult in your mind, go to step number three. Would you send them a brother in section? Would you send them walking to take public transit or to get eggs or milk? If you would, it's because it's safe enough. If you would not, it's because it's not, and we gotta do it better. I mean, what if everything we did in sustainable mobility, the indicator was that it had to be great for an eight and an eighty? I mean, it would be great for everybody. We need to stop building cities as if everybody was 30 years old and athletic. And we're gonna build cities for all. It's that simple. That's what eight an eighty cities is. I mean, previously, before we leave going to Canada, I used to be in charge of parks and many things in Bogota. And one of the things I learned is not about the money. I was doing on the other side. One of the things, for example, in one term, in three years, we built two metropolitan parks, 50 stone, and over 200 neighborhood parks. Here, they both came, gave a mask for a million people. Nothing happened in 27 years. Nothing happened. There was not a sidewalk. Nothing. And one of the things that I learned, that we're going to learn in the government, is that the citizens pay us every other week is to get things done. Not to find 20 excuses why things cannot be done. So anybody that works in the government has to become a champion at finding solutions to the problems and not at finding problems to the solutions. That's why in 27 years nothing happened. And in three years, we turned it into the most successful urban park in Colombia. We build sidewalks and bikeways and places where you can run and walk in gigantic children's playgrounds and events and activities. And one of the things, the Ciclovia. The Ciclovia was a small program. This is something great that can work in any city anywhere in the world. Cities of 10,000 people, or 100,000, 10 million, or 20 million people. You don't need any capital cost. You have the streets. All you need is to open the streets to the people and close it to cars. I found the old Ciclovia 95 and 50 kilometers, a few thousand people. But I realized the Ciclovia is a wonderful way to change people's minds. Why? Because all of a sudden we realize that the streets can have different uses according to the time of the day, the day of the week, the week of the year, and the benefits. It's like an exercise in social integration. It's good for public health and the environment and economic activity. And you see people of all ages. And all of a sudden we went from 30 kilometers to over 91 in two years. And we can protect some of the parts. This is something that is great, and we have helped now. Bogotá has been the model, not only Ciclovia in Medellín, and many cities in Colombia, but New York and San Francisco, and Mexico City, and Guadalajara. I mean, you see the young and the old, and the rich and the poor, everybody. In Bogotá, over a million people come out every Sunday of the year. So it changes people, and it opens half miles of sustainable and just cities. Because all of the sudden, the Ciclovia is one of the few places where you see the wealthiest people in the country riding their bike and doing activities with their spouse and their children with the minimum wage workers doing the same activities. So, what are the elements of sustainable mobility? And I'm going to end with this. The elements, the most important is pedestrians. People walking is by far the most important of any city. Why? This is because every single trip begins and ends by walking. We walk to the cars, we walk to public transit, we walk to the bicycles, we walk to places. Every trip begins and ends by walking. So walking has to be the priority. I mean, we have been building cities for thousands of years, but it, it's been only in the last 80 or 100 that we, build, we have been building cities thinking more on car mobility than on people's happiness. And this is what we have been building. This is an insult to humanity when the little space for the pedestrian is invaded by, 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 by cars. All of a sudden we find money to do four, six, eight lane roads for the cars and we don't have money even to do the sidewalks. We're telling these citizens every day you are a second class citizen. This is something that should not be happening. Anywhere. Everyone in these cars in Dubai, once they get out of the car, they walk. Everybody's the best. So how are we going to do this? It's something that is absolutely critical. And similar to walking, in cycling. Cycling is just a more efficient way than walking. When we're going to go one kilometer, we walk. But if we're going to go four kilometers, we bike. And we're going to go 20 kilometers, then we take public transit. But in order to, for public transit to be efficient, we got to have nice public spaces. And then we got sustainable community. I mean, walking, cycling, and public transit, they got to be best friends. Because they all help each other. I mean, walking, cycling, 
it's not a free quality. Walking and cycling is not a joke. I mean, walking and cycling is the only individual mode of mobility for most adults. Walking and cycling is the only individual mode of mobility for every child and youth around the world. Walking and cycling is the only individual mode of mobility for every child and youth around the world. So safe walking and cycling should be a right. Unless you think that only the people that have the money and the age and the desire to drive a car have a right to individual mobility. And if you take a world individual, you don't only walk in cycling, but also walk in France, should be a right. That's what we're talking about democracy and human rights and equality and sustainability. I mean, it's not democratic to see a speaker with 80 people going behind a car with one person. We gotta create cities for all people. I mean, every year, 1.2 million people die in traffic accidents. 1.2 million. 270,000 people walking on the streets. 200, it's 740 each day. I mean, imagine, imagine for a second. Many of you came on a plane to Medellin. Imagine you got four planes flying all over. One over Colombia, and the US, Australia, and China. And all four of them crash today. And another four tomorrow. And another it's a huge world crisis. But that's how many people walking are killed every day. The equivalent of five planes full of people. 55,000 people will be killed by cars during the week that we are having this conference. It's the equivalent of 28 air violation planes. And what are we doing about it? This is not accidents. What are the politicians doing? What are the decision makers? What are each one of us doing about it? Like I said, we gotta solve problems by using the same kind of thing we use when we do anything. So it's time to be bold. I mean, we gotta. I mean, when we gotta solve mobility issues by building more roads, what do we do? Even if these cars were running on air, there is just not enough space. So how are we gonna use the roads? I mean, trying to solve mobility by building roads is like trying to put out a fire using gasoline. That's important. So I now invite you to think outside the box. We got some challenges, but more than challenges, we got opportunities. That's why now we have some representatives of youth and citizens that are going to tell us how do they get to places and what are some of the offerings. And this is from Silvio Paseo Bogotá, Laura Mendoza, Despacio, Carlos Cadena, Ciudad Verde, Lorenzo Casullo, Vito Yuga, Advice Report, John Alvarez Villa, Ciudad Lute. So, first one, Andrés Vergara. Okay, each one is going to take two to three minutes to talk about one issue that they confront when they are moving around the city. 